Hello, everyone. Hello, welcome, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Angela Lovzarenka, and I am with Lactation Education Resources. And we have our session today on learning about becoming an IBCLC. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Sakita is my co-presenter. Sakita, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, good morning and afternoon and evening, everyone. I am Sakita Lewis Johnson, board certified family nurse practitioner, IBCLC and birth doula. And I am um, happy that you decided to join today. So Sakita is located, if I may, Sakita is located um, in Detroit or outside of Detroit in Michigan in the United States. I am outside of the Washington DC metropolitan area. I've been a board certified lactation consultant uh, for over 20 years and I've worked in community support uh, for almost 30 years. So yes, um, it's, been, it's been a minute. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, please, if you'd like to turn on your cameras, feel free to. If you would like to mute or unmute yourself in order to ask questions, feel free to do so. We really do, Sakita and I both really like the any sort of interaction that you have. So we have some content that we want to review first and then we will go ahead and, um, and answer questions. So you can either ask during the presentation or you can ask at the end, whatever is more convenient for you. And we are recording this session so that we can share it with others later. So thank you very much. So becoming a lactation consultant, you are here today because you've got a dream and you have a dream to support families and assist them in their journey. And I say to you all, welcome. Welcome to you for coming. Sakita and I both came from that same background. We wanted to support families and to help them along their journey. Uh, and, you know, the nice thing about breastfeeding support and lactation consultants is that we all come from a variety of different backgrounds. So regardless of your previous education or experience, there is a pathway that will suit you. So what is the IBCLC? So that is the International Board Certified you, and the IBCLC stands for the International Board Certified Lactation Consultant, and that is a certification or a credential which is offered by the International Board of Lactation Consultant Examiners, also known as IBLCE. Now, there are over 32,000 IBCLCs in over 122 countries and territories, so you're in good company. Please, if you have questions, do take a look at their website. Uh, Julie Grimes is also works in customer support for lactation education resources, and she can make sure that there is a link in the chat which provides some of the resources that I'm going to be referring to today. So she'll pop it in the chat, and if you'd like it, please feel free to download it, and you can click on the links which are there. So when you take a look at the IBLCE website, you'll notice that they have different regional offices depending on where in the world you reside or you work. And so do review the requirements and the pathways to become eligible to take the IBLCE exam. Well, what do you need to know to be an IBCLC? The detailed content outline or the exam blueprint is based on surveys of IBCLCs in a variety of practice settings around the globe. The outline covers all of the topic areas and the chronological states that an IBCLC needs to know in order to do their work. So lactation education resources, we offer the courses that are listed in the detailed content outline and our courses are approved by LARC. And I'll get into that in just a moment. So that the LARC is basically the organization that evaluates and approves lactation consultant courses, training courses throughout the globe, throughout the world. So now I'd like to turn it over to Sakita to introduce you a little bit more about what an IBCLC does. Sakita? Thank you, Angela. So I get somewhat of the fun part, uh, the passionate part in me. Love this slide because um, there's so much to when you be decide to become an IBCLC to understand what you're getting into. What does this look like? Um, and so 
I have listed some adjectives, some nouns, some descriptors to describe exactly what an IBCLC is, what we do, and how we function. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this slide as I talk about each uh, descriptor that you see listed on this screen. I want to call your attention to the one in the middle at the top, competent. Um, competent is really having the necessary um, ability, knowledge, and skills to do something successfully. You will notice that there will be lots of different um, titles and different lactation professionals. We're all important and we all have uh, a certain level of competency. However, we also have a scope of practice and that competency level extends beyond, uh, above and beyond. There's like science to this. So although, um, in the, if you want to look at chronologically, the lactation field started in, in the 80s really and took off. Um, it's fairly a new, new uh, profession. However, there's still um, a blueprint, as Angela alluded to, and, and a level of competency that you have to have in order to uh, really do this work in a meaningful and really a way that we're not harming. Um, people that we're passionate about, the people that we're we're uh, passionate about helping. So competency is for you have to be competent and you get that. Angela will talk about the different pathways and how competency is perceived within the lactation field a little bit later. Um, timely, um, you know, if someone calls you and says, well, first of all, think about this, a lactating person or even someone who may be gestating, who may seek you out for some information, um, that's probably during a very vulnerable time. First of all, to even ask someone is vulnerable. You put you in a vulnerable position. So when someone reaches out, you know, if you don't reach back out to that person in a timely fashion, that could make or break their lactation journey, their lactation experience. It could also uh, make or break the credibility of you as a clinician or as a lactation professional. Culturally appropriate. I use the word appropriate um, for a lot of reasons. I won't get into that. But what I will say is that being culturally appropriate starts with cultural humility. Cultural humility is actually a defined word. It's defined by the NIH, which is the National Institute of Health. And it really is a lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique, whereby the individual not only learns about another culture's, but starts with one's own examination of his or her own beliefs and cultural identities. So notice, again, I said culturally appropriate. I'm, my background is nursing, and I want to preface this by saying that um, Angela said we come from all different backgrounds, but I remember in nursing school over 20 years ago, things that were said, oh, this group of people wash their hair this many times a week, or this group of people don't. That's not what culturally appropriateness is, um, because within every culture, and I'm going to define what actually culture really is. Um, it's the customs, values, arts, social institutions, and achievements of a particular nation, people, or other social group. So within every culture, there's a subculture. So to be culturally appropriate means, first, your own self-awareness of who you are as a person, what you're bringing into each encounter that you have. And that's going to be so important because our families, families that seek help in lactation, just like we all come from a very diverse background, they too also come from a very diverse background with subcultures. And so, you know, sometimes in, and I'm going to, I'm going to keep going back to, I'm going to own this and claim this as nursing, um, as a nursing thing, because that's my background. I hear people say, oh, they don't do this because that's not in their culture. That's something that's really not an appropriately, an appropriate thing to say about a particular person, despite what you know about their outside appearance, right? And so being culturally appropriate is so important for so many other reasons. Um, but I just want to leave that there. That's a big part of who we are as lactation professionals. Being skilled, you know, 
when I talked about competent, um, there is a difference between skill when we talk about high level lactation care versus education, right? Um, think about the difference of someone who has chest or breast tissue that um, for whatever reasons biologically may not have grown according to what the norm is, right? Do you may be competent, you may have the knowledge, oh, okay, something's not going right, but do you have the skill level to support that person? So there's the difference. High level lactation care, and I'm going to group that because you'll see that at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to group that with skilled because there is also a difference. I work in a hospital setting, um, and there's also a difference in supporting someone who has who's on life support for for intensive purposes, which means intubated with the tube, the machine is breathing for them. That takes a high level of skill to manage that type of client, to know how to manage everything and everything around medications. There's a lot to it. And so I want you to think about these things um, as sometimes we romanticize lactation and, and, and breast and chest feeding. And in some ways, yeah, a, a, the, do the breast crawl is like fascinating, right? Um, that first latch is fascinating, right? Watching the interaction between families and fascinating, right? But, but behind all of that passion has to lie the skill level that each individual family deserves based on their particular experience and circumstances at that time. And so that with that comes being an advocate a person who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause or policy. Whew, that's a lot of this work. If I had to say about, I would say 50% of this work is advocacy. Um, Cause you know, again, I, I mentioned the word vulnerable and not to, to play this lightly, but a person in a vulnerable state may not be able to advocate for themselves because they may have something else going on. And, you know, the way I would say in the climate, I would say I'm going to speak to to the US and I apologize if there are those across the the, the waters that um, it might be the same. It may not. But there's this this push to, you know, talk about uh, the whole option and equating the I don't want to say that the organizations, but equating um, human milk with other forms of milk, right? It and, and that's driven by dollars. So the advocacy that is needed when we say the world needs your passion, when I think about passion, that the, the first word at the top is advocacy. Uh, advocacy, because there will people who will try to shut you down on any cause or any policy based on their own agenda. Without understanding and without the behind science and without understanding that human milk is the first organic food ever. It is it. And so if you're going to go out and justify and spend all this money, which I'm not sure if some of the organic food that's labeled organic is, but that's a whole other topic. But Human milk is organic milk, let me tell you, okay? So that's the, that's 50% of our job. And with advocacy, there comes, there's a certain like um, speaking up and speaking out that is necessary for advocacy. Uh, problem solver, being able to solve a problem. I'm gonna tell you, um, I've been a consultant for over 10 years. I've been a nurse for over 20. Even being a nurse, there are some things that you're going to come up against, or, or or lactation professional, that you don't. You're not a walking encyclopedia, a walking lactation textbook, a walking um, medication in mother's milk or medication in human milk. So there are going to be some things that you may have to pause and say, I need to solve this, but I got to go, I got to know where the tools are. I got to know who my resources are. And so with that comes, you know, building out your network of people uh, that's in your area that can help you problem solve. Along with that, I'm going to lump researcher with that. And the reason why they're separate is 
is, is for a couple reasons, because you can be an IBCLC and be someone who carries out academic or scientific research. A lot of IBCLCs do that. And that is very, that is so very needed because I said, what, we have a new profession. And you will hear people say, well, that's not evidence-based, right? So we do need IBCLC researchers out here doing this academic work. But also researchers can be framed as when you're asked something and you don't know the answer for it, it is a person whose job means I need to go discover or verify some information before I speak this or before I tell you this. Um, and that lends to your credibility. So notice on the slide I have credible. If you're out willy-nilly in it and you can't problem solve or go back and research, how credible? Are you going to be as a professional, as a clinician, as anybody, really? You can't just tell anybody anything and then they find out something different and it was clouded based on your bias or even based on your inability to pause and say, I really don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Let me let me check it out, though, and I'll get back to you. Right. Um, policy advocate, uh, policy advisor or creator. A lot of uh, policies are created. Uh, if you ever heard of United States Breastfeeding uh, Committee, policies are created. Uh, IBCLCs are advisors on those policies. And so that's a part of, of the frame of, of what we do. Trust it. I'm going to pause for trust it real quick because there's a lot of distrust. There's a lot of distrust, not only in the world, but in the medical field. And so the way to become trusted is to do no harm. The way to be trusted is to listen. The way to be trusted is to really get to the crux of that self-awareness and what you bring into the space with every single interaction with every single client. And again, starting with doing no harm and that self-awareness a lot of times when I talked about culture being appropriate, we come into spaces where we know some things, certain things about clients. For instance, if you work in certain institutions where you may be privy to a little foreknowledge, but you've never met this person, you've only seen this person on um, paper. So the, the, the just thing to do would be to understand just that. You don't know the person. So you have to really sit in that and understand you don't know their subjective world. If you come across as knowing that you know someone that you've never met just because you read what's on paper, that's a red flag of that the rapport, the trust, won't it just won't be there. And so I always say that um, I love when people say, oh my God, I was looking for the lactation consultant, right? Versus oh my God, I just can't do another lactation consultant, right? Because if someone says that, that means that someone potentially violated their trust in our profession. So keep those things in mind. We are essential workers. I put this here, and this, is, this probably wouldn't have been here pre-COVID. It wouldn't have been here pre-COVID. But as we think about what essential means, who essential people are, being a person who's who's done telehealth and being a person who is still doing work in the community, some people, not everyone can do telehealth lactation. And if in and to know what we know about infant feeding during emergencies, a pandemic is a true emergency. And so we are essential workers. And I and I will say that about all lactation professionals, not just IBCLCs. We are essential workers. And so along with saying that, collaborative care partner. I want to um, talk about a collaborative, what that means in, in different forms and different ways. On this particular slide, I'm talking about collaborative care partner as your relationship with your client you're serving. Understand, we are not the driving part of the plan they are, their goals, what are they hoping to achieve? 
We are there to collaborate and 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 kind of help and facilitate them reaching their goals. But you know, we know um, if if or some people may know. I'm not going to make the assumption. But when we talk about exclusive breastfeeding is recommended for the first six months, exclusive. I would love for everyone to do exclusive breastfeeding, right? I I live for this. I but that's me, right? That's my goal, right? Someone else's goal may be, I wanted to do both formula and breast. I can educate, I can talk about the benefits, risk. I can do all of that. Give them the in true informed information to make their choice. When they make their choice, it is absolutely their choice. And I'm going to proceed with, how can I help you achieve whatever that goal was that you set? after I've done that. That's what being a collaborative care partner is. Um, so we're in partnership with families. Uh, next slide, Angela, please. Before I move on to this slide, were there any questions? Are there any questions about anything or clarification that I said on that first slide? I know that was a lot. Um, and I don't know, I get passionate so sometimes, so sometimes I speak real fast. Uh, you can even chat, slow down, Sakita, if you want to, um, and I will slow down. I am not above critique. So um, any questions? Julie, anything come up? If not, I'll keep going. So I talked about collaborative care partner. Um, and I said I was going to talk about it in two different two different in forms, but this I'm going to continue with what's called person centered care. And person centered care is providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that the patient values guide all clinical decisions. That sounds exactly like a collaborative care partner. So when you are providing person-centered care, and that is defined by the Institute of Medicine, that is the definition uh, that I read for you. There are there's this is a model of care, and this model of care includes culture, which I've already talked about as being the customs and values. It includes care. I'm going to pause and talk about care delivery. Care delivery looks different for everyone, especially in lactation. In lactation, uh, people, some people are modest. Some people are, I'm gonna let it all hang out. Some people are, I, I please don't touch me. Some people are, please do everything. Latch the baby, touch me, do all, right? Care looks different for everyone. And that's what person-centered care is. It's not saying, well, I'm Sakita and this is how I usually help. I usually just go in there and I get all the pillows together and I, you know, tell them they got to hold their breast like a C and not with the scissors. And that's not, that's not, that's a, that care is not patient centered. Okay. So this is a model of care. Um, communication. Communication is huge. It's huge for a lot of reasons, uh, particularly in Angela mentioned that I live in the Detroit area. Uh, the community I serve is four different languages, um, inclusive of English, Spanish, Bengali, and Arabic. And so how am I communicating with my clients who speak Arabic only? What does that look like? I had, I had that during the pandemic, actually, where I had to say, okay, say a no to this person because I it's not an option because I don't speak Arabic. In the hospital settings, because we all work in different hospitals, I had the privilege, and it is such a privilege to be able to call different length to have a language line that have a multitude of phone numbers. But what do you do if you're working in the community and you're presented with that? Are you able to tap into resources. Have you ever thought about that? What would I do? If not, start to think about that. Because, um, you know, sometimes we're in a privileged position. I was able to say, hey, real quick, and, and social media was my friend. I need an Arabic uh, person to translate. Because saying no in a pandemic 
for someone who is calling me and they need help right now, that's not an option because I'm passionate, because the passion is there. And I know that, again, that person is vulnerable to even seek out help. So um, communication, how, how are you communicating? What type of tone do you use? And not just tone with your language, but with your body. Communication is more than um, talking. When you go into someone's space, do you put yourself at their level? That's person-centered. If you're standing above a person and talking down to them, that's really not, that doesn't fit the person-centered model because you're assuming hierarchy in this. You're assuming that you are the lead and they are to follow, okay? So communication involves a lot of different factors, a lot of things to consider in lactation world. Um, and uh, I think you all get the point on that. Collaborative, collaboration includes that shared decision-making with your client. But now I wanna talk about collaborative care as in the broader framework. If you are afraid to talk to physicians, if you are afraid to work with other lactation professionals, if you are, if you can't talk with um, the nurse about this care or do a handoff to another lactation, that's not really collaborative. In this work, we're part of a team. We are part of a team of and the team is so big and it's growing. But when I say team, we are part of a team of doulas. We are part of a team of midwives. We are part of a team of neonatal nurse practitioners. We are part of a team of pediatricians, obstetricians, ENT. Um, these are all people, PT, OT, uh, craniosacral therapy, uh, therapists. The, the collaboration can look it can look really, really, really like, whoa, who am I talking to and about what, depending on your client and your client's needs. So understand that that's that other part to uh, person-centered care is understanding that we have a scope of practice as IBCLCs and anything outside of that scope of practice, we, need to, we should be collaborating with the other professionals where it falls within their scope of practice, if that makes sense. Next slide, please. All right, so anticipatory guidance. Try to follow me if you can for a brief moment because everything that follows this slide, I want you to have this frame and this lens. So pathway, Angela is going to talk about different pathways, however, while she is speaking, I want you to think about these things. I want you to think about the market where you are, wherever you live. What does the job market look like? How are you going to function as an IBCLC? What are your opportunities? And also, I want you to think about what are the opportunities for the market and how you can be that driving force for that market. Because again, we have a scope, there's competency, there's all of these policy driven things that you will be able to bring to the table with your passion, with your skills, with your education, with your knowledge. You can drive the market as well. So market. So when Angela is talking, think about your your geographical area market. What is it? What, what are the things that I may have to do to kind of figure out how I'm going to fit into my area or Am I going to have to move to a different state? Maybe. I don't know, right? Mentorship. Who in your area? Who? Now, you may be saying right now, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know anybody, blah, 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 right? Trust. There is someone in your area that has a like-minded space or that can actually mentor you even now virtually. So think about who in your area could potentially serve as a as mentorships. And it's funny because 
there are people who email me and send me messages on social media, right? And then the next thing um, I know, they're like, yes, Akita was my mentor. And I'm like, really? I don't know that person, right? Um, and it's simply because they asked me a question and I answered it. And, or they might have asked me several questions and I've answered them, right? But who are you? Who is your go-to person? While Angela is speaking, she's going to talk about pathways, and there are different requirements for those pathways. Which pathway is going to be applicable to you? So as she's speaking, if she talks about the first one, the first pathway, um, if those requirements are, are not specific, you, you, you can focus on what, what the um, necessary needs are, but think about how you're going to meet the requirements. So if there's, for instance, if there's one that says you need, let's, I'm just going to, I'm just going to throw this out here. If you need 2000 hours of clinical, you don't need 2000, but I'm just saying that versus 1000, right? How are you going to reach your requirements? So think about that. Look, look forward to framing. How does the requirements, how am I going to fit that into my everyday life of working, of if you're a parent, being a parent, um, also, if you're helping with school, online school versus drop off and pick up, how are you going to fit all the requirements within your daily living um, and roles and responsibilities? And then the last thing is private practice. When Angela said we work in a variety of settings, some, some of us work in private practice, which means we have our own business, right? So if you're, if that is your thought process, if that is your plan, then that's a whole nother business aspect that if you don't have a business background, not only will you be researching the requirements and doing the requirements, but you need to be researching, how do I even do this private practice thing? How do I get started? How much money is it going to cost? Blah, 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 right? So the, I want you to look at, and this is, again, I am not trying to, I'm trying to give you the real so that you understand one of the things about nursing and, and then I'll, I'll pass it to Angela. But one of the things about when I first got into nursing, I was like, you know, and they were like, oh, become a nurse. You help people and you do this and you do that. And then even as I became a labor and delivery nurse, everyone thinks it's like, oh, babies. There are some things that I wish someone would have kept it real with me and said, hold up, you want to do what now? Now, I probably still would be a nurse. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I, I probably still would be. But what I'm saying is there is a level of um, realness to understand when you take this pathway, the, the seriousness. And when we talk about passionate, uh, the peace to it, we need your passion. This is the type of passion I'm talking about. Like, yep, go for it. Don't let it scare you. Just understand that what we're trying to do is provide that anticipatory anticipatory guidance so you won't be like i didn't know i didn't know you know now because akita and angela are giving it to you straight so i am going to pass it over to angela now and let her do her thing and um if you have any questions you can hold them until the end or um, I know Julie Grimes is our tech person. She's helping with our questions. And so, you know, feel free to keep keep chugging along as you were. Awesome. Thanks, Sakita. That's really helpful to have that uh, that check. Um, indeed, one thing Sakita and I want to do is to be real here and to give people um, an idea of what it means to be an IBCLC. And so now to the nuts and bolts. So the actual requirements. So there are three requirements th as in each one of these pathways. There are three different requirements. One requirement is the health sciences education the second one is the 90 hours of lact lactation specific education. And the third one is the clinical experience. And someone is already typing into the chat about the question about clinical experience. So I'll get to that in just a moment and we'll actually answer that specific question. So here we go. So the first one is health sciences education. And I'm going to read some of this information just to make sure that it's all out there. So what is the health sciences education? Well, it's some of the typical courses that are needed in order to be a healthcare provider. So there are eight post-secondary or university level courses and six general education subjects. You can find a full list of the 14 subjects on the IBLCE website, 
or you can search for it. You can just pull up a, um, a search engine and search for it or take a look at the resources that we have in order to find um, that link that lists all of the different health science requirements. So the eight university level courses, and you don't need to write these down now, they're in the IBLCE document, is biology, anatomy, physiology, infant and child growth and development, introduction to clinical research, nutrition, psychology, or counseling skills, or communication skills, they're all considered to be one, so any one of those iterations, and finally sociology, or cultural sensitivity, or cultural anthropology. All of those counts. Now those can either be done online or in person as long as the institution is accredited to do that learning. So if you took your courses during your college career, they count, even if that was 20 years ago. LER, we partner with Walden University to provide these basic courses. The advantage of working with Walden is that they're online, the courses have been chosen by us, so we took a look at what IBLCE requires and we took a look at what Walden has and we chose the courses for you. And the nice thing about working with Walden is that you can apply for financial aid. The six general education subjects are medical documentation, medical terminology, occupational safety and security for health professionals, for health professionals, sorry, professional ethics for health professionals, universal safety precautions and infection control, and basic life support. So five of the six general education courses can be taken through us, through LER. The only one you'll need to search for is basic life support. In many countries, there is an in-person skills check for this training, although I have recently heard of some organizations providing this training completely online. COVID-19 has done wonders for expanding our universe and allowing plenty of opportunities that are online, so we don't necessarily need to be in person. So I do recommend that you open a search engine and check with your local resources as to whether or not you need that in-person check of the skills for basic life support. In the resources section, in the resources guide, excuse me, there is a link to the health sciences education guide, and that will provide you with a general description of each course. Now, please be mindful that IBLCE is international. The names which are used in the document to describe the courses may not exactly fit the course from your accredited educational institution, but, but that's okay. IBLCE uses broad terms with the understanding that there is no universal description for what a course in, for example, clinical research will cover. So you may be asking, well, why are these 14 courses required? Remember that the IBCLC is a standalone credential, meaning you don't need another certification, degree, or license to practice as an IBCLC. Once you pass this exam, you will be an allied healthcare professional. The courses will help you to be prepared for your, for your degree as an IBCLC and help you to pass the IBLCE exam. Okay, and I see some questions coming in, so this is great. The second one is lactation education. This is where we've got you covered. So the education can be comprehensive, needs to be comprehensive, excuse me. The education should be comprehensive and cover the IBLCE detailed content outline. IBLCE requires at least 90 hours of lactation education and five hours on communication skills. Our five-hour course is specific to lactation and breastfeeding care to help you in your practice as a lactation consultant. So the third piece is this clinical experience. So with this third component is the, is the lactation-specific clinical experience, excuse me, so this can be in person, or it can be via telephone, or it can be online breastfeeding and lactation care, which supports breastfeeding, chest feeding, and those who are human milk feeding for their infants. Also, lactation assistance to pregnant and breastfeeding clients and lactation education to family and or, and or professionals counts as part of your clinical experience. These hours are to be obtained in the five years immediately prior to sitting the exam. And so how many hours of clinical experience do you need? Well, that depends upon the pathway that you choose. 
So the pathways. So the amount of clinical experience that you need depends on which pathway you choose, as I just said. The hours do need to be accrued in the five years prior to applying for the exam. Pathway one is for healthcare professionals and those who provide breastfeeding support through an IBLCE recognized breastfeeding support counselor organization. The list for that is in your resources handout. Healthcare professionals includes physicians, nurses, midwives, dietitians, physical therapists or physiotherapists, speech pathologists, and others. Again, the list is on the IBLCE website and we have the link in your handout. Breastfeeding support counselors include those who are accredited through organizations such as La Leche League International, the Australian Breastfeeding Association, the Breastfeeding Mother Support Group in Singapore, among many others. As of this presentation, there are currently over 40 organizations that have applied to IBLCE and are on the approved list. Again, you can find that list on the IBLCE website. So Pathway 2 applicants, they must complete a comprehensive academic program in human lactation and breastfeeding through an accredited university. Their education has both the, did the didactic and the clinical components, and they require 300 clinically supervised hours working with breastfeeding, chest feeding, and human milk feeding families. So Pathway 3 is a structured mentorship program between an IBCLC and the applicant. The IBCLC or IBCLCs, there can be more than one, must be in good standing with IBLCE. Those who choose this pathway must have their program pre-approved by IBLCE prior to beginning your clinical hours. And I understand that this process is happening relatively quickly now, like within just a few weeks. So a couple of notes. For those of you who have breastfed, chest fed, or provided human milk for your child, the hours you spend nursing, pumping, and helping your friends does not count, do not count towards your clinical hours. Sorry. While 500 or 1,000 hours does seem like quite a lot, there's a really good reason why. Each candidate needs to have the clinical experience so they can provide competent care as an IBCLC. You wouldn't want someone taking a class and then in for, let's say, a few days or a week or so, and then actually doing surgery on you. You wouldn't want one of your providers to do that. So that's the reason why you need these clinical hours. If it's any consolation, the number of hours used to be a lot more. I've known IBCLCs who needed anywhere from 2,500 to 8,000 clinical hours before they could sit the exam. Don't know if it's any consolation, but it used to be much different. So pathway one, this 1,000 clinical hours. Give me just one minute. Ah, here we go. Okay. So candidates who are applying for the IBLCE exam through pathway one need the thousand hours. For the candidate who is also a healthcare provider, the hours can be done in a hospital, birth center, clinic, lactation care clinic or practice, a primary care practitioner's clinic or practice, or through independent practice as a licensed or registered healthcare professional in a non-healthcare setting. For breastfeeding support counselors from an IBLCE recognized organization, their hours can be earned either in person or online. The location and type of support depends on the criteria provided by the recognized organization. Now, hours earned before 1 January of 2022 are counted at a flat rate. I see someone asking this question in the in the comments. So for in-person care, you get 20 you get excuse me, for in-person care, you can count 500 hours per 12 months. For telephone or online care, it's 250 hours per 12 months. After the 1st of January 2022, the hours will be counted on an hour by hour basis. So two important points about the clinical hours. It's important for you to document those hours as you accrue them. Be very detailed in case IBLCE chooses to audit your application to take the exam. They will want to have some sort of verification of these hours. And these 1,000 hours do not need to be directly supervised. Okay, next 
comment here, and this is pathway three. So for pathway three, so those who are with pathway two, I'm going to skip over that simply because that's part of the accredited university program. So that's why I'm going straight here to pathway three. So it requires 500 clinical hours, and this experience must be directly supervised by a board-certified lactation consultant or IBCLC in good standing. It's best done in a busy practice setting where you can work with many breastfeeding, chest feeding people and those providing human milk for their babies every day, such as a hospital or clinic setting. There's an application for this pathway. As I mentioned before, it must be planned and approved by the IBLCE before you embark on your program. The hours count towards the 500 when you're actually working with family. The observation hours do not count. Remember that this clinical experience is graduated. So first it'll start with observation and then doing tasks under supervision and then completing those tasks independently with the IBCLC nearby to ask questions and to discuss situations. Now recently I had a conversation with Amy Black who is our clinical internship director and she and I agree that most people spend approximately 75 hours in orientation before you and the IBCLC feel comfortable with having you work independently and that's when you can begin to accrue your 500 hours. So it doesn't start the moment you walk in the door and introduce yourself. It starts after both you and the IBCLC feel comfortable with you taking on those tasks independently. So take, how do you find a mentor? Take a look in your community to find a willing internship site or mentors. You may need to reach out to many people to find someone with the time, experience, and capacity to agree to be your mentor. It's important to find a good fit. Talk to others who've been through pathway three to find successful strategies in finding a good mentor. If you're interested in this pathway, go to the IBLC website and download the Pathway 3 Plan Guide. Again, that's in your resources. Find a mentor, complete the application, and submit to the IBLCE. They must approve your plan before you can begin to accrue hours. And yes, I know that's the third or fourth time I've said that, but I know how disappointed people are when they are a couple of hundred hours into their program and then realize that they need to have it pre-approved. Therefore, those hours that they spent before it was approved cannot count. Now, it may seem daunting to think, well, I have to fill out this application and then I have to wait for that approval and then I can start working or start doing work with the IB, IBCLC. No, no, go ahead and once you have someone that you're comfortable with and they're comfortable with you, go ahead and start that observation piece. That is something that you can do before your application is approved and as I mentioned, it's usually a relatively quick turnaround time to get that Pathway 3 document approved. So LER does have an internship program with sites around the United States. You can reach out to our internship director to find out more information. So now I know that this pathway is an additional step or two. Um, is it, and, and is it worth it? Maybe your question. And the answer is yes. IBLCE reports that students who come through pathway three score best on the exam. Now I think it's that mentorship piece that's such that's so important and I think that that is the key component. Learning from an experienced clinician is well worth the extra effort at the beginning which is involved with tackling this pathway. So before I, so let me say are there any questions before I get into the specifics, the interim guidance? Julie, has there been anything? Yeah, there's been a lot and I've gotten I think most of them. Um, but one that you might want to expand on, I've, I've answered a little bit, is if you can use your CBS to get your pathway done. I did explain that it had to be in a clinical setting, it couldn't be private practice, but if you wanted to speak more to that, you can. Right. So it, it has to do with you need someone who is not directly supervising you, but you need to be working through some sort of organization where they can where it's actually in your scope of practice to be doing this work. 
Some people in the United States will use the Women, Infant, and Children program or the WIC program. Others will work um, part-time, let's say, in a practitioner's office, let's say a pediatrician's office, in order to gather those hours in order to support families with a certified breastfeeding specialist, which is our certification. Uh, you can be working, let's say, in a provider's office and providing lactation care. And the reason why has to do with the fact that there needs to be someone who's actually seeing what you're doing, at least knowing what you're doing, right? So your supervisor, for example, may be a physician, and while they don't know what it means to be a lactation consultant, they're sort of supervising your care to make sure that if, if Ibelsey comes back and says, did this person actually do their hours, they can make an attestation and say, yes, indeed, this person was working in my clinic, this person was working under our uh, organization, such as La Leche League International, to say, yes, indeed, you actually did perform these hours within this setting. And so that's something which is important is that you need to have someone who can attest that indeed you did complete those hours. If you're working completely independent, for example, as a certified breastfeeding specialist, there is no one who can sort of make that attestation. And so that's the challenge. And that's the reason why it needs to be in some sort of not directly supervised, but some sort of arena or some sort of area where indeed you are able to provide that care. Hopefully that makes sense. What other questions? Anything else? I know Julie, you uh, can answer all of those questions because you are one of our amazing customer support people. So indeed, um, indeed, I know that you sorry. answered them, but what else is there? But one of them was um, whether or not, uh, so some, so if somebody's employed, so that they could become, they could get more hours if they became a CLC, and could our training prepare people to take the CLC? And one of the things that I did put into the chat, there's a link for that if anybody else is curious, it's a link to the Who's Who in Lactation Support by the United States Lactation Consultants Association. And with that, talks about it shows all the different types of lactation um, accreditations out there. And one of the things it shows is that the CBS and the CLC are pretty much on par. In fact, um, if you take our 90 hour program, it's more than the CLC. So you might want to be able to show that to employers um, right. that uh, that it is a equivalent um, certification. certification. Right, yes, exactly right. Good, good, good. Okay, so now I'm going to go on to the interim guidance because I think this is important and please excuse me, I am going to read quite a bit of this. And the reason why is because I, I want to make sure that I am conveying the information from IBLCE correctly. So a lot of people are asking whether or not they can accrue hours via telehealth during the pandemic. And the short answer is yes, you can. The longer answer is paraphrased from the IBLCE documents. In part, they say, during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, IBLCE published specific guidance about attaining clinical hours when face-to-face -face interactions were curtailed to reduce the spread of COVID-19. The documents are dated 17 April and 6 October of 2020. The guidance provides information on how, quote, clinically clinical eligibility requirements could be met by leveraging technology, end quote. IBLCE will allow the use of technology if certain parameters are met and are allowed by your practice setting and by the IBCLC guiding practice documents, such as the scope of practice, the code of professional conduct, and the clinical competencies for the practice of IBCLCs. The key provisions include attention to privacy, security, assessment, demonstration, and evaluation of relevant techniques, provision of evidence-based information to clients, as well as appropriate collaboration with or referral to other healthcare providers. Particularly emphasized is Principle 3.2 of the Code of Professional Conduct, which requires advance written consent from the breastfeeding parent prior to photograph photographing, recording or taping either audio or video that parent or the child. So another important point about the use of technology for Pathway 3 interns is there should be observation using technology with two-way synchronous audio and visual components 
The focus is on the mentor providing mentoring and guidance to the applicant. Another important provision is that candidates in Pathway 3 mentorship programs may earn 100% of their minimum of 500 hours of directly supervised lactation-specific clinical practice through technology platforms. This guidance has been extended until 30 September of 2021. Again, that is in your resources document. It's important to read all of the IBLCE documents listed in the interim guidance. The link to the guidance is found in the resource document which accompanies this video. I hope that made sense and indeed there are a lot of specifics, but it's important to read all of those documents. You may think, well, why do I need to read the scope of practice if I'm not an IBCLC yet? And the answer is, is that you want to make sure that you're following those rules and regulations so that your hours actually count. Okay, so the Lactation Consultant Training Program, which is what we have with LER, we've got a, this is a very comprehensive course. It's 90 hours, 90 plus hours actually. It's eligible for SERPs, which is the Continuing Education Points, points for Lactation Consultants once you're certified, CME for Physicians, and Advanced Practice Nurses. It also has a uh, nursing contact hours and CEs from the American College of Nurse Midwives. So know that our classes are taught by more than 35 instructors. It's economical because we, I'm sorry, let me go back to the 35 instructors. They are practicing lactation consultants. They are researchers, they're authors who teach on specific subjects and they're actually those subject matter experts that teach in our classes. Our classes are economical because you don't have to travel to another city or you don't need to pay for a hotel or per diem and you don't need to leave your family or your job in order to take our courses. Furthermore, your online learning is convenient. You can study at home at a time which works for you. You can study at your own pace, even go back and review something which you didn't catch the first time through because not everything that can be crammed into a short period of time. It's, a lot, it's really overwhelming. And that's actually what we found. We, we taught on-site training for over 15 years and students left our program rather dazed and confused by cramming everything into such a short period. We think that spreading out the classes helps with comprehension and retention of information we, you can work on the modules whenever you have a small window of time available, and you can integrate the information into your practice as you go. Have a question for the instructor or want to discuss a concept with your fellow students? You can go to our virtual student center to ask. We have a very active Facebook group, and I chuckle because it's very active, where our students can meet and support each other along the way. Upon completion of the 90 hours, the, upon completion of the 90 hour course, you're eligible to take our certified breastfeeding specialist exam. The exam is included in the price. Once you pass, you are a certified breastfeeding specialist. With this certification, you can begin to collect your hours towards becoming an IBCLC. Oh, and also our courses are available. This 90 hour course is available for six college credits through Walden University. So the core and the bridge class are two other courses that we have. The core class is exactly what it sounds like. It is the 54.5 hours of lactation education. Again, also eligible for SERPs, CME, and nursing contact hours. At the end, you are a certified breastfeeding specialist. And it is eligible for three college course, college credits through Walden University. Now it's called the core course because it provides you with that core lactation education. It covers some, it covers topics such as anatomy and physiology, infant growth and development, supporting the preterm baby, medications and breastfeeding, and many more. Once you successfully complete the exam, you are a certified breastfeeding specialist. The bridge course is ideal for people who have the basic lactation education components and need an additional 45 hours to qualify for the IBLCE exam. Topics in our bridge course include legal and ethical courses, excuse me, legal and ethical concerns for lactation consultants, infant feeding and disasters, breastfeeding the infant with medical challenges, case studies, and clinical skills videos. 
So if you're really at the precipice at the beginning of your journey and you're not sure which way to go, I would suggest trying out the core class and see if it fits. See if the content that's presented in the core class actually fits what you think it means to be an IBCLC and or a certified breastfeeding specialist and see if it's work that you want to continue. So you may also be asking, well, who is LER? You may not have ever seen me or Sakita or our program before. So let me just explain a little bit about who we are. A lot of you may know us from our handouts. We have over 50 free parent handouts on our website. They're in English, Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, and they're intended for breastfeeding, chest feeding families, and those who are providing human milk for their babies. We've been around for 30 years. We started, as I mentioned before, as an in-person training at Georgetown University. We found that there were barriers to this in-person training, and so we switched to online. I mentioned that because when COVID came around, we continued to do what we do best, which is to deliver high-quality online content. Many were scrambling to get their content online, and we were already here. We are true to this. We're not new to this. We are approved by the Lactation Education Accreditation and Approval Review Committee, also known as LARC. We are committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion in our content, in our instructors, and in our leadership. We have a three-tiered scholarship program. Tier one is we partner with organizations such as ROSE, BIMFA, Indian Health Services, the DC Breastfeeding Coalition, the Bloom Collective, and others to provide them with the breastfeeding education scholarships for their lactation support providers. We have a Rising Tide 2 and 3 scholarship, which provides a complete scholarship to aspiring IBCLCs, which includes the 90-hour training, the clinical hours, and the test prep book, and the IBLCE exam fees. So why should you choose us? Well, as I mentioned before, we are online and on your own time. We have expert instructors with real world experience. We are here to support your journey. We have tech support seven days a week. I think that's really important to note. You can send an email to our support forum and someone will get back to you relatively quickly. You can also pick up the phone and call us. Many are surprised whenever they call the number expecting to leave a voicemail, and sometimes you will, but for the most part, we've got a fantastic customer support team who can answer your questions on the phone. And also understand that several of, several of our staff members are certified breastfeeding specialists and or IBCLCs. So they understand the journey. They've been through it. And that's why we're here to support yours. And we can answer with those real world experiences as well as that, those little pieces of information which can help you along your journey because we've been through it. You can get your content questions answered by the field. For example, last week someone reached out to one of our instructors with a question from her own practice. We made the connection to the instructor and the former student received the answer to help her client. Another student had a question about creating a policy at their hospital and we found the appropriate instructor to answer the question and to provide additional resources. So thank you very much for your time today. I really want to applaud your commitment to breastfeeding, chest feeding, and families who provide human milk for their babies. We're here to support you. What other questions do you have? And you're welcome to unmute yourself or Julie. Do you have any questions that I should mention while on, on this recording? Um, let's see, I'm trying to see if there's anything I need you to expand on. Um, I would like to chime in, Julie, um, real quick, because I saw I saw something that I want to make sure that there's clarity on. Um, when Angela spoke about the standalone credential, um, someone asked about going back to nursing school and whether that was necessary. Um, no, it's not. Um, I will say, um, I love the way Julie answered the question about most hospitals are really stuck on registered nurses as licensed personnel. There's reasons for that. But remember I said that we are advocates, we are policy changers. There are ways that we can influence the market. And um, this is a, something that I'm very passionate about. And I want to make it clear, I am a nurse, yes I am, 
but I have been around nurses who are IBCLCs and IBCLCs who are not nurses or physicians or dietitians or all of the other healthcare sciences. Notice you take health science courses just like those professions, right? However, your credential is your standalone. And just because one is a physician, just because one is a nurse, it does not make them more qualified as an IBCLC. I've seen nurses who are IBCLCs who are awesome and fantastic. I'm one of them, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I've also seen the opposite, right? And I know that when the more hands-on experience you have, so those clinical hours, your mentorship, your desire for professional development and where you get your education is a big part of that. Um, and so rest assured that there is potential to change hospital policy uh, with advocacy. Uh, I've done it. It is doable. Um, and, and there are um, lactation professionals who are working in hospitals that are, that do not have that license. And I want to just be clear about that. There are certain, Angela's raising her hand, there are certain geographic areas that um, haven't caught on, and then there's others that have. Um, and so rest assured that an IBCLC is an IBCLC. Standalone means that you can practice as an IBCLC, understanding that you practice within your scope of practice. And I just yeah, I was agree. gonna say that uh, as far as that, whether or not in hospitals, the irony to me saying that generally it's in a hospital that requires it is that on our staff at LER, I believe that Sakita is our only nurse IBCLC. And almost all of the other IBCLCs on our staff work in a hospital. So um, it, it can be done. It's just that we've tended to find that it's possible, but the, thing, but the other settings don't as consistently. Right, and so it depends on your jurisdiction as far as where you can practice. I have worked in a, I worked in a hospital for over 18 years and helped our hospital to become baby friendly. The policy concepts that Sakita was talking about and advocating for IBCLC care is something which I too have been passionate about and have done. I have also worked in private practice, as has Sakita. We've also supported people in the community. Sakita, Julie, and I have all supported people in the community as both volunteers as well as um, as someone who is is paid for our expertise. So indeed, there's a wide variety of opportunities which are out there as an IBCLC. And so I would encourage you not to become discouraged if um, the hospital that you use, that is in your region only hires those who have another license or certification. Um, continue to educate, continue to advocate, and in, in the hopes that indeed change shall come and they will realize that the IBCLC is the minimum standard that you need in order to provide that skilled lactation care. So you do need to, to adhere to the um, regulations within your community, but know that, I mean, you're looking at someone here who, as I said, worked in a hospital for 18 years. So, and there are, and I agree, Julie, <laughs> almost all of our IBCLCs do work in a hospital setting and Sakita is the uh, lone nurse. Sorry, Sakita. <laughs> Hope you don't feel lonely. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I don't. I know I'm always in good company with IBCLCs, regardless to their background. So I'm all good. Excellent. Good. Okay, great. Um, oh, somebody asked a question as far as when the exam application window is open. They just updated it literally Friday, Thursday or Friday. So you can go to our website, lactationtraining.com, and on our website, we actually have a countdown clicker for when the next examination uh, application window is due. So the new application window is December 8th of 2020 to January, January 20th of 2021. That is the application window. If you would like to sit for the exam, which will take place April 27th to May 6th, of 2021. That is a departure 
from what IBLCE has done in the past, and it was just published a few days ago. So indeed, please do take a look at our website so you can find out more information. Read, view, and download those resources. Julie, can you pop it in one more time? Um, it, pop in the resources link one more time. And uh, for those of you who are watching this video after, there should be a resources PDF, which is attached to this recording. So please do download. Also, if you have further questions, you're welcome to reach out to me. My email address is a love l o v e at lactationtraining.com or if you want to test out our wonderful support forums, probably shouldn't say that, it, you are welcome to go online and uh, email us at support at lactationtraining.com. So please do email us. Please do reach out to us. If you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer your questions. I would like to invite those who uh, need clarification to you don't have to show your face but this is we chose this kind of space for engagement and interaction so if you want to take yourself off mute and ask your question uh, feel free to do so while while you have us here so nadine asks how can we access this to rewatch it we will be posting it probably on our youtube page and on our website. So we will be making announcements on our social media as well as far as how you can access this recording. It will be everywhere. <laughs> Hello, I have a question. Hi, um, yes. Is this, is this exam window you're talking about, is that offered once a year? So no, the IBLCE exam is offered twice a year. Oh, okay, thank you. Sure. It usually happens, just FYI, IBLCE usually has the exam around the March timeframe, March, April timeframe, and then the second one is usually around the September timeframe. But note that in order to apply for the exam, the application is due several months prior, anywhere from four to six months prior to actually taking the exam. And it has to do with the international nature of the exam. Kavisa, I hope I'm saying your name right. You were trying to decide between pathway two and pathway three and any, you know, suggestions on pros or cons. So indeed, you know, pathway two requires that you have to, uh, you know, go to college, as Julie just put in the chat, so that you can get this degree in lactation. Um, and so there are there are approximately, I think, eight programs currently. Um, around the world actually there's more around the world i believe no it's just eight around the world right yeah there's only eight programs around the world now i will say that one of them is online and so one advantage of of going pathway two has to do with the fact that you can apply for financial aid so if indeed um cost is a barrier to becoming an ibclc you may want to consider that it is an undergraduate degree that you will receive it's actually part of an undergraduate program, and so it's it's essentially a um, an associate's program if we're talking about it from a U.S. context. It's basically an associate's program, and so you do need to go through the university, and they have other requirements as well in order to achieve that um, in order to achieve that degree. So pathway three is something that you can do independently, and you can do that in your own time as long as you accrue those hours in the five years prior to sitting the exam or applying. Let me make that clear. The five years prior to applying for the exam. So both the lactation-specific education as well as your clinical hours and the college courses all must be complete prior to applying for the exam. So there's this lag. For example, for the 2020 or for the 2021 uh, examination, the first one that will happen in 2021, you apply between December 8th and January 20th of 2021, but the exam is not until April. You can't spend that time between January 20th of 2021 and April 27th of 2021 in order to finish up things that you didn't complete. You do need to have everything done prior to actually applying for the exam. Any other questions? Hopefully I answered your question completely, Kavisa. If not, please type in. 
And yes, most, most IBCLCs have gone through Pathway 1 or Pathway 3. I will say, as I mentioned before, that those who complete Pathway 3 usually perform better, better on the exam. And this is not any kind of insider information. It's actually on the IBLCE website about the exam uh, administrations in previous years as far as they actually break it down now according to Pathway as far as the scores are concerned. And as I said, I really do believe that it does have to do with um, having that mentorship piece. Jessica has mentioned to check out your state and or territory uh, and or um, coalition, breastfeeding coalition. I highly recommend that as well. It's a fantastic resource, not only the US Breastfeeding Committee, but also there are coalitions in every single country around the globe and maybe not Antarctica. I, sorry, uh, but there is there are um, coalitions that are all across the globe, and so please do reach out to them in order to get connected, to find those local resources, to possibly find an IBCLC who may be willing to mentor you, and or what it means to be an IBCLC. Talking to someone who's actually in the profession really is helpful to help you to make a decision and a, and a determination as to whether or not this is a good fit for you. So thank you, Jessica, for mentioning that. Any other questions? I just had a question. Oh, please. Yes, I had a question. Um, I'm going through pathway one, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to clarify with the log. Um, I currently work um, in a mother baby unit. Um, do I have to have our lactation consultant sign off the time that I spend? Um, educating and breastfeeding? No. And or, the reason in your pathway one, correct? Yes. So no, you only need, it does not need to be directly supervised. So you just need some sort okay. of a supervisor who's willing to attest to the fact that you actually did complete your thousand hours if you're audited by IBLCE. So okay. actually, I'll just have I put that. in there a couple times. I put in there the link to the document page or the IBCLC information page and I'll put it in again. Uh, but on that page is something called the Lactation Specific Clinical Practice Calculator. It is a um, spreadsheet. You have to download it to your device to get it to work, and it asks you when you work, how long have you worked there, how many hours a week, how many weeks per year, what percentage of your time is spent with breastfeeding. You fill that out and it calculates it for you. And as long as it says a thousand and you have a supervisor that attests that what you put there is true, you should be fine. Right. So I'll put that thank in you. The, I'll put the link in again. Okay, thank you. And uh, the YouTube channel, it's the lactation training dot com YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and type in either lactation education resources or lactation training, you should find us. Excellent. Sakita, is there anything else I missed or that you'd like to share? No, not that I can think of. No. Okay, great. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. I, yeah. today. Oh. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. So thank you very much for joining us today. Really do appreciate your time and uh, to come and engage. And indeed, I highly encourage you to uh, feed that passion and do become an IBCLC, do become a lactation support provider, do become a certified breastfeeding specialist. We need you. We need your passion. While there are 32,000 IBCLCs around the world, you may not find many in your location. And so we welcome you and we want to support your journey. So thank you very much for attending today. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.